better run, man. Life's a pain, but you got me. Yeah, life's a pain, but I got you. Hey, what's up, Parasites? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog, and screw it. I just said, you know what? Before I shut on all the lights and everything, I said, just record the next one now. <laughs> just get it done with, so that way you can just spend the next like week or two or three weeks um, editing a lot of these and getting them up you know, whenever they need to go up. Because I have my surgery in about two weeks, so yeah, I want to get all this stuff done and uh, and out to you guys and, and have time to stockpile and edit some. So I figured, why not? Just Let's just keep going tonight. So we have here Extreme Venomverse 4 and 5. Um, and uh, this is, you know, the last two issues of this mini series. Five just came out. So, you know, uh, hopefully it'll still be some time that you had time to read it before I post this up um, because I don't like to just talk about things as soon as they come out always. I sometimes I might make an exception if I have a lot to say, but for the most part, I want to give a little bit of time in there. So you guys who sometimes fall behind like I do can catch up and then we can discuss it all together. So Extreme Venomverse number four starts off with The Bloom of Doom. Uh, this story is by Peach Momoka, and it is a Nuff Said story. I don't know if none of you are old enough to know what that is. There was this time in Marvel history where they did one month of comics called Nuff Said's, and it was just artwork. There was no dialogue, no caption boxes, no nothing. It was just artwork, all visual storytelling to, to kind of tell the story that the artist wanted to show. And I like that. I think there were still kind of vaguely scripted by writers, but for the most part, it was just the artist telling the story and I always like those those are really fun to do a whole issue without a single thing of dialogue hopefully will get you to look at the artwork more and appreciate it more because we always talk about that where it's like a comic book artist's worst thing to hear is the average reader spends maybe seven seconds on a page uh seven to ten seconds reading a comic book but it'll take them you know a week maybe even to draw the page and so it's it's tough you know it's it's a lot of hard work you know it's like making movies and tv shows you put months and months and years into it and everyone absorbs it in two hours and, and judges it based on that without seeing all that hard work that goes in. So, uh, so yeah, so I hopefully you just kind of hang out and appreciate Peach Momoko's art on this storyline because it's really, really good. And what it is is it's a, you know, a planet that uh, has something crash land on it. The symbiote drips down, lands on a plant, and ends up essentially becoming part of Mother Nature in a way. Uh, now, again, this is me and kind of my interpretation of this story because there's no, vi you know, like dialogue to kind of drag it along. But it does visually show a lot. I just don't know if I'm interpreting it, you know, interpreting it properly. So let me know, you know, down in the comments below. If you took this story in a different way, I'd love to hear that because I feel like this is one of those stories that could be open to interpretation. Because um, you have this planet where the symbiote is bonded to these plants and then this life form, this pixie or whatever shows up and the symbiote's like, oh, I'm going to eat it. And it does and kills it and then sees other life forms, other pixies, and is like, okay, I'm going to go kill all them. And it can't reach all of them because it's stuck to this one plant. So it starts to expand and grow into the soil and start taking over other plants so it can start eating more and more pixies to the point where this happens. It pretty much wipes out the planet in a way leaves all these dead pixies in its wake, all these dead plants, um, you know, trees that are no longer blooming, and just it, just the creature is blooming, but nothing else is. And because I think it's part of Mother Nature now, it feels sad for what it's done. It's laid waste to this world, which, you know, if a symbiote bonded to the, the essence of the world, it would feel sad. It'd be like, wait, no, 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 I'm supposed to bring life. I'm Mother Nature. I'm not supposed to destroy it. So what it does is it retreats into the soil. And I'm assuming we flash forward like however many years, you know, till to the point of mankind type beings are born and they build buildings and cities and everything like that. And then because the symbiote is part of Mother Nature, it starts raining, you know, as the, you know, stuff from the earth move particles and everything move up into the atmosphere and then change and alter and then now the next rainstorm, or this rainstorm when it happens, has symbiotes in it. And as it's raining down on people, it's changing them and turning them into symbiotes. And it's kind of like crying now because once again it is laying waste, in a way, to this world. While the greenery is seems, at least, to still be blossoming. So, I don't know. I'm interpreting that. I mean, there's a couple of different ways to interpret it, but I think it's 
going into the planet, becoming part of nature, and then generations later, you know, getting to the point where it becomes part of the rain. And then on its first night as part of the rain, it starts transforming people and, you know, thus the cycle continuing. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So I don't know if this is a, a like a Mogo Venom planet um, or I don't know, because it's you see Mother Nature. It has, you know, the storm has an eye and it's raining symbiotes down on the buildings and, and looks like the world is coming to an end almost again and being transformed by the symbiote. So really hard to tell a little bit. So let me know what your, you know, what your takeaway was or what I missed or what I misinterpreted. I'd love to hear it because I, I don't know, my brain goes like three different ways, but I feel I, I keep landing on this, that the symbiote bonded to Mother Nature and this is just the, the, the results. Um, so if you saw it differently, let me know down below. Uh, but then we jump to the noir universe, the Marvel noir universe. So we go to Marvel's May 1941, where uh, we have Father Brock. Um, you know, so Eddie in this world is a priest and he got into some gambling. He has a sin and he got into some gambling and mixed up with the wrong people. And one of them is an old friend of his who is, you know, who's now turned into a mobster and he owes him money. So the guy comes by and threatens Eddie and Eddie prays for something to save him. And that's when the symbiote arrives. And there's a quote from the Bible talking about how darkness, you know, will arrive um, with the venom of crawling things of the dust. Uh, and so that is joined him and said, come to the light, Eddie. So I like that they had the religious, you know, undertones there but then also making Eddie a priest, which is which is pretty fitting for the character on some level. Um, and then he bonds to this creature and goes to the top of the church and screams to the heavens and becomes Venom. And, uh, and in this world, he decides, all right, I'm going to go and pay a visit to that mobster guy. Look at that. That piece of art is amazing. Uh, this book, uh, this story is called The Teeth of Beasts, and it's written by DJ Bryant. And this art is by Alvaro Lopez, who crushes it. I love that drawing. And, uh, and so what happens is the Sin Eater killings start. Eddie goes and kills that guy who came and tried to rough him up. And even though he's an old friend, try to, you know, get his money back and say it was going to come out of the church somehow. And Eddie goes and kills him and then leaves his body there. And a detective finds it. And, and you know, Eddie wrote on the wall, Sinner, and thus creates the Sin Eater murders. So I thought that was cool that they tied that in too as well. So the, clearly DJ Bryant is a fan of just lore of Venom's lore or did research on it um, or something because they knew one how to fit this into the noir universe, which I like because, you know, Spider-Man noir is a fantastic comic book, um, but then and, and character and interpretation of Spider-Man, but to fit this in and it feel like it belongs in that same world while still not being attached to Spider-Man. I also like that a lot. Like that's really, really cool. Uh, Venom can stand on his own as we've seen with the movies and stuff. So seeing this, um, you know, happen, is really cool. And then we have uh, the guy from the comic books, Emil Gregg, shows up and is goes to the church and confesses for the murder and says, I'm the sin eater, I'm the sin eater. So he's a fake, he's he's lying, obviously. He's, some, he's on something else. Maybe he's killed other people, but he's talking about the voices in his head and everything like that. And that's when uh, Eddie goes, oh, cool. So we have our scapegoat and Eddie kills him and, uh, you know, has him bond to the symbiote. So he looks like a monster and then pulls the symbiote back just as the cops arrive. And the cops arrest him as he's taking credit for the murders because the symbiote even furthermore put the thoughts into his head that he was the killer because it can transfer memories and stuff. So a lot of cool stuff from the Venom lore in this story. And this, I got to say, is probably one of my favorites out of all five issues. I really, really like this story and I would love to see more of Venom Noir because Carnage doesn't kill him at the end and Anne Wang doesn't recruit him. So I'd love to see furthermore what happens to him in his world. So maybe we'll get a cool Venom Noir miniseries one day by DJ Bryant where he meets Spider-Man. That would be really, Spider-Man Noir. That would be freaking awesome. So Marvel, get on that, please. Um, and then the last story here, Sparkle and Shine by Alyssa Wong, who's currently writing the Deadpool book, which has some Carnage stuff in it. And then Ken Nomura, who is doing the artwork. Very anime inspired. I really like this story. It's about a young girl who gets a hairpin that essentially is possessed and uh, and has like that's the pin right there in her hair it's talking to her and it's you know it's it is venom it's like the, it's itself is cre it's a uh, known as i guess it's known as venom but it's like it's a living cr creature you know possessing a hairpin or something like that uh so it's a little different so they call it necroco um is the overall name because once she it becomes the lethal protector and bonds with the hairpin and lets it you know take over her that's what she becomes is necroco 
so yeah, very, very uh, anime inspired, uh, this one. The, from the art and everything, there's these lizard guys that show up and attack her school. And she fights back and dismembers them, even though some of them grow their limbs back. But she still takes, takes them down, chews some of their heads off, bites into them, and saves a girl named Parker who is a girl that um, she has a crush on. So uh, Ellie is the main girl, and that's who Necroco is. Her real name is Ellie Ellison. And then you have Parker, who is a girl she has a crush on in school. And so she saves Parker. Uh, and, you know, Parker's like, no, please, please don't hurt me. And then the next day in school, everyone's like, oh, my God, Parker, you're the girl who you were almost killed, weren't you? And she's like, no, I wasn't. That, that creature, whatever showed up, I think she's kind of cool, and she saved my life. And so they show what really happened through Parker's eyes of that encounter where she was helpful and Necroco was trying to help her. So, uh, so you know, another universe where a Venom has a happy ending and we don't see, like, you know, Carnage show up and kill her. We don't see Anne Wang show up and recruit her. So whether that happens or not, we'll have to wait and see in a, later on. Uh, but at least for now, like, we got to meet these three, this this plant, you know, uh, kind of swamp thing, Mother Nature Venom, and we got our detective, you know, uh, not really detective, more of a, you know, priest father in the noir universe, and then Necroco, who there's been a lot of fan art of this character out there. A lot of people are really gravitating to her, which is cool. So it's always cool to see a new symbiote favorite among the fans. And, and people who don't read these books monthly, hopefully getting into them now because of, you know, stuff like this. So yeah, Alyssa Wong, Ken Nomura uh, on the Necroco story, DJ Bryant, Alvaro Lopez on the Noir story, and then Peach Momoko on the, you know, the Bloom story. Really cool stuff. Again, all different takes of Venom and uh, and very different. That's what I, I was going to say about this is, you know, the editors, everyone who put this together, um, you know, we have Devin, Devin Lewis, obviously, and Lindsay Kohick and Tom Groneman um, and C.B. Sobolski as the editor-in-chief, but everyone who kind of worked with these writers and came up, you know, developed these stories with them or heard their pitches, they picked a, a very different set. Like every issue is very different than the previous one and they pair them up pretty well. So to have like a Peach Momoko story in one where there's like an anime story at the end kind of was fitting to bookend that noir story in the middle. And I think this, this was done very well. So to give credit to the editors, because I know sometimes I give, you know, constructive feedback, some of it negative um, towards editors. I would say, like, in this case, everyone is doing a really good job with this Venomverse stuff, from the digital unlimited stuff to the print stuff. All of it's been really fun so far. So um, now here we are in the last issue, and I will have some digital codes go up, but I only have digital codes for the first three issues. So in the last episode, we gave digital codes for the first issue. We gave two out. So in this episode, I have the code BOOM for issue two right there, and then right after that, I'll put the digital code for issue three up. So first person to go and put those codes in, you can get issue two, get issue three if you want, or get one issue and save the third one you know, for someone else or whatever you want. But if you get the codes and you use them, I want to hear your review and what your thoughts are down below. Let me know you got the code so people know that they've been used and, uh, and that they've been you know taken and stuff. So yeah, let me know down in the comments. I want to hear from you guys. So yeah, code two and then the code for issue three should be going up now as we switch over and talk about Venom Extreme Verse or Extreme Venom Verse number five. Which, before we get into this, I want to talk about my friend Jordan Bloom, who was a friend of mine in California. We had dinner a couple times to talk comics. He used to come to the comic shop I worked at. Uh, I think he still goes there, obviously. Great writer. He's worked on a lot of things. I think he worked on like Community and, um, and uh, American Dad and other shows. And um, he did recently the, the, um, the show with MODOK, you know, with Patton Oswalt. And he's a big X-Men fan, so I hope when they revamp X-Men after the Jonathan Hickman, Jerry Duggan, you know, Kelly Thompson, all that stuff. When that ends, I'd love to see them go back to a more classic X-Men approach and Jordan write some of those stories because Jordan is a big X-Men fan and he's an awesome dude. And seeing him do this was really great. And what I liked about this was that I believe I was the one who told him that he his story was going to be in this book. <laughs> I don't think anyone at Mar he like he pitched a story to Marvel and uh, and he didn't know if if it was going to be in Extreme Venomverse or not. And then the solicits came out and I wrote him. I said, dude, congratulations. I saw your name on a Venomverse book. And he said, oh man, this is the first I'm hearing about it. He's like, actually, I sent that in and I didn't even know if it got picked or not. Um, so that's cool. So I, I was, it was cool to kind of break the news to the writer, but also not cool because I feel like someone probably should have reached out to him and someone probably did later that day. Um, but you know, the solicits probably went out a little earlier. Sometimes that happens. Um, but, uh, you know, so still it was just, it was kind of a neat exchange with Jordan. So we're going to get into his story here soon because he's the one who wrote 
Major League Venom. But first, we're going to talk about Jeff the Land Shark, who is living with Kate Bishop. You know, the two of them are friends. And as she's doing laundry, she wants to wash his little you know, doll that he chews on. Um, he starts to venom out. He starts, you know, wants to play, essentially. But he's causing havoc. So she's like, oh, my God. So she grabs her bow and arrow, her quiver, and she runs out to the park to get an open space so that she can, you know, hit Jeff with something maybe to calm him down because he's growing as he, you know, venoms out. He gets bigger and bigger. And so this story here by Kelly Thompson and Gurhiru, uh, who does the artwork. I, I, hopefully I'm saying uh, Guri's uh, name right. But uh, amazing art. Did the double trouble stuff, I think, with Marvel. Um, so it does a great job here with Jeff the Land Shark. And what ends up happening is Kate realizes, you know what? He just wants to play. He's just, he just, you know, he's a little feisty. He's a little scary when he wants to play. Um, like some dogs can be, I guess, sometimes. Um, that perception where you're like, oh my God, it's, it's scaring me. But really, it just wants to play. And Kate's like, okay, cool. So we'll go play. And then, but we need to, you know, bring you down. We need to bring you back down to just a regular shark and not a symbiote shark. So she comes up with the idea when they hear a concert happening to bring Jeff to the concert. And that causes him to go back down to normal shark size. <laughs> and yeah, that's it. That's the story. <laughs> it's like nothing super deep, just something random and fun. And sometimes that's good. It's it's good to have that in as a palate cleanser or a precursor to darker stories. And we kind of get that here with the next story because the next one is like a, my friend, like I said, from my friend Jordan Bloom, Field of Screams. Um, this is a Major League Venom storyline where Eddie and his friend Richie were childhood friends. Peter and Uncle Ben are at a ball game. And uh, they want to get a hot dog, but they don't have the money for one. And so Eddie and Richie are underneath the bleachers stealing food that's not being eaten and drinks. And, you know, sneaking out onto the field and sneaking into the park and going to see baseball games. And so pretty cool. You know, it's like someone who uh, Jordan loves baseball. He loves sports, too. And, and uh, so having that kind of like feeling in a Venom story is kind of neat. Like it's a very all-American type story where these kids like sneak into a baseball game. It reminds me of stuff like rookie of the year or sandlot or those kind of movies where those are just like fun summer baseball movies uh for kids and that's what eddie's childhood starts off as but then as he grows up and becomes a reporter his friend richie still loved baseball so much that he went and worked at the parks uh, at the you know at the park uh for this baseball team and was the one who like brought them water and, and stuff like that like the team he was like a, a team pa or something you know he would bring them towels and all that stuff and what ended up happening is richie caught some players juicing up and they killed him and they killed him by turning into symbiotes or so they're juicing up with some kind of symbiote strand that turns them into like a, you know carnage type or, or phage type monsters and uh, and they end up eating uh, Richie and sucking you know, all of his life force out of him so Eddie wants to get revenge and he shows up and he talks about how when he was a kid after him and Richie started to part ways a little bit uh, a meteor struck a tree in his backyard and then he took a part of the tree and turned it into a baseball bat and he became <laughs> like major league venom basically uh so yeah and so then he goes around and he starts beating up all the uh symbiotes and he does something that i actually wrote in my book uh rhino originally it was called taurus but i changed it to rhino and uh, and in that book it ends with um a sprinkler system being hacked into or not hacked into but changing out the water and putting in gasoline or running gasoline, adding it to the sprinkler system. So when you light a fire, it, you know, the sprinkler systems kick on in this mansion that I wrote in the story. And then it just added, you know, fuel to the fire essentially. So the fire just got bigger as more water with gasoline in it was spraying onto the, you know, the flames. So that's what he does here. Jordan actually does something similar where the sprinkler systems in the ball field are changed out with uh, gasoline, you know, venom set that up beforehand because he knew he was dealing with symbiotes because of he's a reporter and then he uses that to you know take him out he hits a ball into the giant screen cause an explosion and it burns everything down and then he walks away all cool like and into the you know, arms or hands of ann wang who then recruits him into her team so really cool congratulations jordan i'm so glad you got to do the book and i know i'm recapping a lot of the the stuff here but i really like that storyline too i thought it was fun um and uh, and i hope you know all of you guys are going out there and buying this book I, like i always say i encourage you even if i talk about spoilers and you haven't read this yet buy it on comiXology buy it at your local comic store buy it in trade paperback wherever you can but check these out these are really really fun stories and it's just always neat to see a different take on characters you love 
like Venom. Uh, you know, I would love to see a multiverse book on Moon Knight at some point. Um, I just think you could have a lot of fun with something like that. But with uh, Venom, it's it's really great. And now we go over to Earth 21619, which is uh, Spider's Eclipse is the name of this storyline. And it follows the events of the Spider's Shadow. So we have not talked about that storyline yet um, on this on this show, but we will. So uh, so that is really cool though that they're kind of dipping into that world. And this is written by Jason Liu and art by Gavin Goodry. And I think the artwork is really good uh, and uh, has a, little, a lot of fun to it. We have a world where Peter Parker, or like Reed Richards has died and Peter Parker has become the fourth member of the Fantastic Four, taking Reed's place, uh, befriending, you know, Johnny, you know, and uh, and Sue and, and the thing. And they're all off on a mission right now, or so, so he thinks, but it turns out they're being captured or, or, you know, kept somewhere from the Kingpin. And the Kingpin had his jaw, I think, removed or broken. And uh, so what he ends up doing is he finds the symbiote and bonds to it. And we've seen a version of like this before where it was a Kingpin with a symbiote. So nothing really new there. But, uh, but still having this as he's now called King Pain instead of King Pin. And, uh, and he starts lashing out at Peter Parker, who is a member of the Fantastic Four. No longer wears a mask because now he's out as Peter Parker um, through the events of Shadows, you know, uh, Spider Shadow, which we'll talk about. So, um, so yeah, just a cool epilogue story to that in a way, uh, dealing with the symbiote and its return and it trying to get revenge on Spider-Man. But as it's about to... Carnage shows up, <laughs> and Carnage does kill King Pain and bring an end to this symbiote once and for all. So as I guess if this really is in the Spider Shadow continuity, this is the last time you're going to see that symbiote um, ever again. So this looks like they're putting a button on that world, unless this is like like that. All the events of that world happen, and this is where it deviates. Maybe it's a what if of that world. Who knows? But I'm thinking it's set in that world, and we have a Carnage who's like, yeah, you know what? I killed another Venom. And maybe one day I'll go out and kill all the Spider-Man, but right now I really just hate Venom. But he's been the one who's been, you know, defeating me the past few years from Donny Cates' run till now. And and I need to, you know, bring an end to all Venoms, including Flash Thompson Venoms and everything, and probably a few Peter Parker Venoms. But uh, at some point, maybe after I finish all the Venoms, maybe I'll come back through and kill that Spider-Man for you. But until then, I'm just going to, you know, take your symbiote and move on. So, yeah, that's the end of that story there where, uh, you know, Carnage again interrupts the events and, and and brings closure to that uh to to one venom so now we have another we have king pain that's now part of this cosmic carnage that's probably going to show up in the death of venom verse so again it's good to know the pieces that are going to be a part of him because he's kind of building a team too he's just absorbing them and then you have ann wang who's building her team which she's not you know joining with she's building an actual army to fight off against cosmic carnage uh because the the small team she had before they got their butts kicked. And so now she's like, no, we need an army of Venoms. And um, I'm looking forward to that. Hopefully she comes and recruits, you know, human symbiote Eddie and uh, and Dylan. But I don't think so. I think it's going to be a side thing on their own. And the last story here we have is like a mech story. You know, it's like a, a, a Neon Genesis Evangelion type approach to, uh, you know, in Kaiju approach to Venom. Where you have Flash Thompson is piloting this giant anti-Venom, you know, suit in a way. It's like a giant mech. Uh, and they have Commander Mayday Parker there, who's given him orders, so it's cool to see Mayday again. And you have a very old and grizzled Nick Fury-looking Flash Thompson, which I really like. And he's piloting this suit against these symbiotes that have uh, you know, come out of the Earth, kind of kaiju-like. And they're, um, they're causing a lot of problems and, and destroying the city. And so Flash is coming in. And they actually did kill, in their rampage, a lot of civilians, one of them being Peter Parker. And so Flash is trying to get revenge for his friend that was killed. Um, and so he brings out the big guns. You know, he's got this like lightning sword type thing. He's got flamethrowers on his suit. He's got, uh, you know, giant beams that come out, um, you know, proton beams and things. So he's ready for this fight and he delivers by kicking the living crap out of these giant symbiote creatures who have uh, taken over this town and uh, ends up saving everyone. And in the end saying, you know, a eulogy to Pete, like, hey, hopefully... I did you justice. I, hopefully I, I um, you know, honored you well by destroying this thing. And then you actually see that Flash Thompson is missing a leg. He has a crutch. You know, he's 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 been through it, this Flash Thompson. Um, but he doesn't get recruited and he doesn't uh, get killed. So who knows what his future holds. But we do know that at the end he is rescued by his two rookies that he was training. 
which is Spider Gwen, and I believe Miles Morales. Um, even though I don't think he says Miles' name, he does say Gwen's name, but I believe it's those two are the rookies that come and rescue him. So yeah, really, really fun stuff. This Extreme Venomverse storyline, I ended up liking. At first, when I read the first one by itself, I was like, uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get into this, you know, all these different Venoms. But then, you know, at that time, I was also, we, you know, we were working on our, our episode 800, and we were doing our versions of Venom. And when I just saw how much fun everyone was having, I was like, that's got to be what it's like for everyone working on these and talking to Jordan and stuff. Like, it's clear that's what it was, was everyone just got to do what they wanted to do with Venom within reason, within, you know, um, you know, probably got some parameters set at some points. But for the most part, got to tell a story that they thought would be fun and different from other Venoms. And I got to say, they did a great job, much like our episode 800, where I just liked everyone's idea. I end up liking all these ideas and some more than others sure but overall i'm like yeah these are still fun i i really did dig these and i'm i don't know it would be fun to see some of them again and if some of them pop up in death of venomverse that'd be great I, unfortunately i think a lot of them are gonna if they show up they're gonna die <laughs> you know so this may be one of the last times we see some of these characters but hopefully some of these guys will live on and hopefully we'll get more you know future venomverse stuff even though the, we're going to the death of the venomverse and we're getting the death of the spiderverse if that's really the case, I hope they stick to that. And then and this say, and this is us saying goodbye to all these things. But it is kind of fun to to see other worlds and what happens in them. Uh, so hopefully, if it is a death, it's it's not a forever death. It's like a comic book death, you know. So, um, but there is more what if stuff out there. In fact, there's a what if book coming out uh, where it's like Venom Dark, where uh, the symbiote bonds to the thing. So we will talk about that at some point. We'll have other multiverse stories we still got to get into at some point as well with Venom and Carnage. Um, we're going to talk about the Deadpool mangas, uh, the samurai mangas, where there was a version of Venom in there. There's a lot of stuff that we're going to still dive into that are multiverse related. And obviously the Death of Venomverse series, we're going to talk about that as well. But I'll wait until after my surgery and once I'm recovering and those will, once those I start reading those and getting into those, I'll start recording them and, and get those videos ready for you guys. But so it'll be a while, you know, for those probably like like late August, maybe mid to late August. Um, but we'll we'll see how I'm feeling and how fast I recover from my surgery. So for now, I'm going to stockpile this episode and uh, and have it go up that week when I'm having surgery. So hopefully you enjoy it. I appreciate it. You know, you watching. Uh, hello from the past. Um, but let me know what you think of this episode and these issues down below. Do you have a favorite of these seven stories? Um, that we talked about in this episode do you have a least favorite you know do you like them all you know let me know your thoughts down below and i'd love to hear them we'll keep talking down there as always thanks so much for watching the show like share subscribe all that fun stuff and i'll see you all in the future peace